In today's world, people are more disconnected than ever. Anxiety, loneliness, and depression are rampant, and young people are desperate for meaningful relationships. From the beginning, EDGE has created opportunities for people to develop in their personal, professional, and spiritual lives. My relationship with my mentor is awesome. Shout out to Jason. You know, he's there for me uh, in terms of any questions I have, both uh, professionally and personally. Earlier this year, my dad had uh, COVID and he was one of the first people to, to check in with me uh, regarding that. So it's, it's nice to know that he cares about me as a whole human being. EDGE continues to provide ways for you to develop as a whole person, to grow yourself and to find your role in your community and make an impact. EDGE offers a variety of programs and events to provide community and safe spaces for whole person development to occur. EDGE groups, EDGE work, and EDGE events are our current product offerings, but we are always looking to expand as a way to better serve our community and to be able to positively impact more lives. We believe that people grow better together. We are all made for community. Once you have expressed interest in participating in an EDGE group, we will pair you with five to seven other young professionals and a carefully selected EDGE trained mentor. And together, you will navigate life, including personal growth, career development, and faith. EDGE group participants commit to a one hour virtual gathering with their group every other week for one year. And because EDGE Groups is a virtual program, you can experience the power of intergenerational mentoring from anywhere. I'm Tony McEwen. I work for Corteva AgriScience, and I lead our global HR service centers. I do think I have the best EDGE group because these women are constantly showing up for one another. So while I'm technically the mentor, there's a lot of moments where I sit back and I don't say a lot, and they just speak into each other's lives. Edge at Work is a one-year cohort-based program that focuses strictly on personal and professional development. Leveraging a curriculum that we co-created with Butler University, emerging leaders are provided a safe space to focus on their own personal and professional development. We focus on everything from mental wellness to overcoming failure and self-limiting behaviors to receiving feedback and managing change. Edge Events is where our entire community comes together. Events are the glue that bring folks from all of our programs together to share life, learn from each other, and address relevant topics within our lives and communities. I struggled in my early 20s with figuring out you have to take ownership of your career and choices. I mean, I think EDGE really helped me gain clarity to make those choices. I wanted to get involved because I frankly wish I would have had something like this 20 years ago when I started my career. If you are a young person who is looking for deeper connection and community, Edge is for you. For those more seasoned, we are always in need of strong mentors. Your life experiences should be shared with others. If you are a business owner or executive and would like to provide a unique opportunity to your employees, Edge at Work would aid in their own personal and professional development journeys. Learn more about how we can partner with you at edgementoring.org. 2020 has been quite a year. Many of us are grieving loss of life, sickness of friends and family, job loss or job uncertainty, and the list seemingly goes on and on. This grief can be overwhelming. One of the most powerful tools we have in overcoming grief is gratitude. Showing thanks and appreciation for all we have to those around us in our personal and professional lives will help us cope with and grow through our grief. Our first keynote speaks, writes, and has a business focused on gratitude through gifting. He has been featured in Fox News, Forbes, Fast Company, and the New York Times. He's the best-selling author of Giftology and the foremost speaker on radical generosity. He partners with some of the most iconic brands in the world. It is my pleasure to introduce John Rulin. Hey Todd, thanks for that very, very uh, kind introduction. Super excited and grateful and really honored to, uh, to be kicking off EdgeX 2020. And I'm sure there's some of you guys, whether the mentors or the mentees or people that are like, man, really? A gifting guy is gonna be speaking and kicking off this event? Like did, like, did Todd hit his head? Like, why? It reminds me of speaking four years ago. I had this opportunity to speak to a group of CFOs. It's about 120 mid-market companies between 10 million and a billion in revenue. And this guy gave me this like 10 minute long introduction. And I get up on stage 
And almost every CFO in the audience like crossed their arms, like in unison. And like collectively, like suck the oxygen out of the room. They're like, really? Like you can tell on their faces, they're thinking, gosh, man, this guy's gonna talk about gifting for 60 minutes. Like, is he crazy? Does he not know what budgets we cut first? So if you're wondering like why gifts, at the end of the day, nobody cares about gifts. But in business and in life, everything rises and falls based upon relationships. Relationships with employees, with clients, with vendors, with mentors, with advisors. And so at a core level, what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes is about relationship building. Because whether it gets good times or whether we're in the valleys, like we have to show up for people powerfully. And people notice when you show up powerfully for people versus pulling back. Because our tendency, whether you're a believer or not, as human beings, the way God's wired us, we don't like to be uncomfortable. And we don't, it's, it's weird to be generous when everybody else is pulling things off the table and, and playing safe. And so before I dive in, before you're like, hey man, this guy's like, maybe got lucky, like the whole gifting thing and generosity, maybe it was born in the right family with a bunch of money, yeah, maybe in LA or New York, the exact opposite's true. I'm a Midwest guy, I grew up on 47 acres in the middle of Ohio. One of six kids, we had a one acre garden, and I got to do one of the more sexy things on the planet every morning before I went to school. I milk goats. I was that kid that showed up at school, literally like with crap on their boots and you know, a little bit awkward. And I learned very early on what I didn't want to do for the rest of my life, which was like bailing hay and 110 degree summers. And so I thought, man, I'm going to go make mom proud. I'm going to go be a doctor. And so I go to Malone University, the small Christian school for undergrad. And my life changed because of a mentor. And that mentor was Paul. He was an attorney. And he was a great attorney, but he was like this rainmaker. Like every deal in town came his way. Like he was incredible. Like he owned the oil wells and the banks and all these different things. And when you grow up poor, you notice when people are really generous. And Paul was the guy that like would find like deals on noodles and literally like in the middle of Amish country would buy a semi load of noodles and everybody at church the next Sunday would walk away with like 20 cases, like 200 people. I'm like, Paul, are you nuts? Like that was like 30 grand. And he just got this smile on his face. He's like, John, that's just who I am. So I work up the courage to go and pitch him. I, I started working with a company called Cutco, the knife company. I had no idea what they were. I had no idea they're international, a couple hundred million dollar company. I just wanted to pay for med school. And so if you've never pitched your girlfriend's dad knives, like it's one of the more awkward conversations on the planet. So I, before church on a Sunday morning, I'm like pitching Paul thinking maybe he'll have mercy on me and order pocket knives for all his clients that are men. They're like CEOs of million and billion dollar companies. And they're all into hunting, fishing, the outdoors. And so I'm like, Paul, what do you think? And he got this smile on his face. He's like, John, I don't want to order pocket knives. Could I order a hundred of these like 80, $90 paring knives? And uh, I looked at him kind of bewildered, like, you want to order a bunch of dudes, like a bunch of CEOs of billion dollar companies, like a kitchen tool? I'm like, Paul, I'm desperate to sell you knives, but I don't understand why paring knives. And he got this little smile on his face. He said, John, in 40 years in business, the reason I have more deal flow and access, more referrals in good times and in bad is I found out a simple truth. And that's if you take care of the family in business, everything else seems to take care of itself. So for me, it was like this lightning bolt moment. I'm like 20, I see Paul at 60. I'm like, I wanna be Paul when I get to be 60. I wanna be like him. I wanna have relationships that flourish and people that are attracted to me. I wanna be able to build relationships like that. And I grew up on a farm, so I didn't know what to do. So I started to mimic Paul. And I started to invest like two, $300 in Cutco carving knives with the CEO's name of a company I'd wanna get a meeting with. And I'd put the spouse's name and I'd, I'd package it up in my dorm room and put a little handwritten note inside that said, carve out five minutes for me. I promise it'll be worth your time. And I'd mail it off to this like $200 million company CEO. Two weeks later, I get a phone call back from the assistant in my dorm room and the CEO wants to meet with me three o'clock next Tuesday. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got class. Like, so I'm skipping class, wearing the one suit I have on. I go into this big, beautiful mahogany boardroom, glass everywhere, wood, and I'm sweating bullets. In walks Mr. Smith, he's in his 60s, and his jaw hits the ground. He's like, are you the John Rulin that sent me the knives? I said, yes, sir. He's like, man, I thought you'd be like some seasoned sales executive like in their 50s. Like, I'm really confused. Are you here to sell me knives? I'm like, no, sir. I'm, I'm actually here to help you and your 1,000 sales reps do exactly what I did to you to your top 10,000 relationships. And his jaw hit the ground again. He's like, you're really good. I said, thanks. An hour later, I walked out of that meeting, that boardroom, with an order for a thousand knife sets. 
I thought Cutco was going to like slap me on the back and celebrate me. And I get a phone call from the CFO, Mr. Welpley. And I'm like, hey, Mr. Welpley. And he's like, yeah, John, we, we got your order. We're just curious, like, whose credit card did you steal? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And Mr. Welpley's like, John, we, like, we've never seen an order this big. It, it's an insurance company. Like, obviously, like something weird and fishy is going on here. Like, what's going on? I said, uh, Mr. Welpley, like, we're using these knives as a delivery vehicle for an emotion. We're actually using your product to build relationships, to drive 10x referrals, to deepen these relationships with these million and billion dollar companies. And he's like, what are you talking about, John? We're a knife company. I'm like, no, you're not. Like the product, like we're mimicking this, using generosity and gratitude as this competitive advantage to help companies grow. And they fought me for a number of years. They thought I was insane. But by the time I was a senior in college, out of 1.5 million reps and distributors in a 70 year history, we'd become their number one sales rep on the planet. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is the system and the methodology that we use to build relationships with clients and employees and partners and vendors for companies from a million dollars in revenue all the way up to $20 billion in, in revenue. We've worked with 25 pro sports teams. What I'm talking about wasn't born in academia, it was born in the grassroots, in the trenches. And so there's five parts to the system. I'm gonna tell one story and then I'm gonna show you what the giftology system is. Because a lot of times people will fight back and say, John, I've done this, it doesn't work. And I'm like, did you follow the recipe? Did you follow the system? And they're like, well, I kind of did. And I'm like, well, it's like baking bread. Either, like, you either put yeast in and you get bread, but if you don't put yeast in that one little thing, you don't get bread. And relationships are that same way. It's the little things, it's the little details. And so I'm gonna walk you through one key story about how I built a relationship with a mentor of mine. And the ROI, and what I call the ROR, the return on relationship, and what that's happened, what's happened with that over the last 15 years. So 13, 14 years ago, I have dinner with this guy who owned controlling interest of 20 companies. And when you meet somebody like that, you're just like hanging on every word they say. I was 26 at the time. And this guy named Chris was like, hey, there's this group called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. It's like YPO, whatever else. I'm like, I have no idea what YPO is. He's like, it's like 12,000 CEOs. Your business would be perfect for that. You'd be a perfect member of that. And so I said, are you a member? He said, yeah. I said, I'm in. So I joined this group called EO. I'm in Cleveland at the time. And he's like, you know what? They're having this big reunion, like kind of this like big celebration. It's like the 20th anniversary. You should go to that. I said, where's it at? He's like, Vegas. I said, sure, I'm in. So I slide the Amex across the board or across the table and I get a bill, my Amex bill a month later and it's $10,000. Like, man, it's a lot of money to hang out with CEOs like this. So I got this event, I was barely, I just qualified to be a member of EO and Steve Wynn is speaking privately to us. I found out one of the guys cut a quarter million dollar check to bring Kiss in privately because they didn't have the budget, he just wrote the check. And I almost left the event because I was like, I don't, I, this is way out of my league. Like guys cutting quarter million dollar checks but then I remembered, I'm like, John, you paid 10 grand to be a part of this. You better suck it up and get some value out of this event. So I go to this breakout and, and I looked at the bio and it wasn't that impressive of a bio. It was a guy that, that worked for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He was the COO. But then I looked deeper and I was like, oh my gosh, they grew from 2 million to 127 million without any debt. So I go to this breakout in Vegas and it's like standing room only. And I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but like when I heard Cameron Harold speak, he's wrote in Double Double and all these books, but when he spoke, everything that came out of his mouth was like gold. I was like, oh my gosh, like, if I could get this guy, not just as a client, but as an advisor, a mentor, if I could get him in my corner, my, my life and my business could radically change. Like I could use his insight. And uh, so I waited until afterwards, took an hour of waiting in line. And as I was waiting in line, I found out he was coming to speak to our local chapter in Cleveland three months later. And I look at the counter, I'm like, oh my gosh, the night before the Cavs are in town, LeBron, we'll go to a Morton Steakhouse dinner. I'm thinking by the end of this, we're gonna be like brothers. So I go up to Cameron, I'm like, hey, your message was amazing. I'd love to build a relationship with you. I'd love to spend some time. And uh, hey, what are you doing the night before? You speak in Cleveland. And he said, uh, I'm not sure. I said, hey, do you wanna go to a Cavs game, lower level LeBron, go to a Morton's dinner? I'm thinking he's gonna high five me. And his response was the most underwhelming response ever. He said, sure. I guess I have, I don't have anything else going on, I guess I'll go. And in my head, I'm thinking, duh. Like almost everybody in business follows the same playbook when they're building relationships with employees or clients. We all take people to dinners and ball games and rounds of golf and all that stuff, at least we used to. Like those are the things, like we all do the same things as our competitors. 
And of course, like Cameron's gonna go on a hundred of these dinners and ball games over the next year, who cares? So I'm thinking, man, I gotta do something else to build this relationship to show him I'm different. And I said, Cameron, what else are you gonna do when you're in town? And he said, uh, I'm probably gonna go shopping. There's some stores that we don't have in Canada. And, uh, and so I'm thinking, man, this is my angle. I said, What's, uh, what store? And he said, Brooks Brothers, I love Brooks Brothers. And so on the spot, I'm like, hey, what, um, I'm a Jose Bank guy, what's your shirt size? I wanna send you a shirt. And he looks at me kind of like bewildered, kind of takes a step back and, he's, and you can tell he's thinking like, does this dude have a man crush on me? Like, it's a weird question to ask another man within two minutes of meeting, like, hey, what's your shirt size? But the Canadian charm came out and he actually was like, um, he told me and he didn't make me feel weird or uncomfortable even though he could have. So I said, great, I'll send you a shirt. So I, I leave there, I go call my business partner right after this breakout and I'm like, Rod, we gotta do this thing with this mentor, this guy, this advisor, he charges like $20,000 a month for coaching. I, we gotta build a relationship, a real relationship with this guy. And Rod's response was, John, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Are you insane? Like that's like three months of budget on one relationship. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. So I leave there, I go to these breakouts, whatever else, it's an amazing event. Three months go by, the morning of Cameron starts texting me when he's supposed to be flying in. He said, John, my flight's delayed. I'm gonna miss my connecting flight. Do you just wanna cancel? I'm like, man, he's trying to weasel out of this dinner in a ball game. He could give two rips. I said, no, Cameron, whenever you get in, we'll just go for a drink. And, I, and he said, okay, fine. So I call Rod, my business partner back. I'm like, Rod, we gotta do this thing to build this relationship. And he said, John, do you believe in it enough that if it doesn't work, it comes out of your personal draw 100%? I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. I said, yeah, Rod, I believe in it enough. He's like, okay, I think it's a stupid idea, but go for it. So before he can change his mind, I put the phone down, jump in the Suburban, go an hour up to Cleveland, go into the Brooks Brothers, put down the Amex. I said, I want one of everything in your new fall collection, all your jackets, suits, belts, pants, everything. They think I'm joking. And with a deadpan face, pouring with sweat, I'm like, I wish I was, I want it all. They're like, okay. They ring everything up, they go to swipe the Amex, it's over $7,000 in clothes. I'm like, oh my gosh, this better work. Load up the car, go to the Ritz, ask for the GM. I said, one of the top business coaches in the world has come to town, do you want to do something amazing? It's the Ritz, what do they say? Sure. So we merchandise his hotel room to look like a Brooks Brothers store. Jackets here, suits, belts, pants. And I'm downstairs and I'm not a big drinker, but I'm so nervous and I'm drinking like a triple on the rocks. And, and I'm so nervous, my business partner is in my ear chiming, he's whispering, he's like, he's gonna think you're a stalker. This is the worst idea ever, this is gonna blow up in our face. I'm like, oh my gosh, Cameron gets in two hours later. You can tell all he wants to do is take a shower and go to bed. I said, Cameron, take a shower, come down whenever, whenever you're ready, not a big deal. He goes on the elevator, comes back down 25 minutes later and his eyes are the size of silver dollars. He's like floating, he's glowing. He said, John, I've had a lot of people do amazing things for me. When I fly to Dubai to coach the Sheikh of Qatar, like, um, and there are 300 companies, I thought that was an amazing experience. He said, whatever you wanna talk about for as long as you wanna talk about it, I'm all ears. So I went into that, that dinner in the ball game. We talked about all kinds of things. I just asked questions, didn't ask him for anything. I was just learning. And afterwards, for the next 10 years, I followed up with gifts for his family. I built him, you know, $5,000 knife set, all these different things. And people are like, John, man, how much money did you invest in that one relationship? And I'm like, probably over, the, over a decade, probably $20,000. And oftentimes when we speak at like Google and these places, we're like, John, like we could never spend 20 grand on one person. I'm like, really? Like you guys got slides in your lobby, like 20 grand, like is, you're missing the point. Because what ended up happening was Cameron came back to me and said, John, what, the way you made me feel was the gift. I can't like have you buy the gift, the, the clothes as well. So one of two things are gonna happen. I picked out some clothes and either you're gonna tell me how much they cost and I'm gonna write you a check for that or I'm gonna guess and I'm gonna round up by 50%. Because I can't let you buy that as well. So that entire experience, the actual Brooks Brothers experience, cost me zero dollars. And I did the math the other day on the other investments of what we poured into him. And oftentimes with like Facebook ads and you know, typical TV ads on these other things, like we're excited if we get a 3X ROI. And what I've realized is that over the last 15 years, our ROR on that is 50X. Literally, a $20,000 investment has produced seven figures. Seven figures. Show me an ROI and an ROR where you get a 50X return on investment. And so what I'm gonna talk about is there's five reasons, there's five parts to the Giftology system of why this landed so well. How I could take somebody that I couldn't even, if I wanted to hire Cameron as a sales rep, I could pay him $2 million and he still wouldn't sell for me. But because I loved on him, because I inspired him, he goes out and sells on my behalf. 
Seven years ago, I was begging to speak for free. We've now been able to book keynotes. Not because I'm the best speaker in the world. I'm not. Like, I'm a farm kid who's milk, milking goats, you know, growing up. Like, but we booked in Australia back in February, back when things were semi-normal for, you know, for Volkswagen for $85,000. Not because I'm the best speaker, but because I have these relationships, these mentors, these advisors, these people that are willing to advocate on my behalf. And there's five parts of the Giftology system, and I'm going to walk you through really quickly of why things work. And the first thing is personalization. Personalization. It would have been very easy for me to just say, hey, I'm just going to do something generic. Hey, hey, Cameron, here's my Jose Banks shirt with my logo on it. I made the gift about him. And oftentimes in business, whether it's one relationship or employees or clients, we're like, hey, I don't have time for that. Here's an Amazon gift card. Hey, I don't have time for that. Here's a koozie or a water bottle or a set of Bose headphones with Allstate, our company logo on it. At a core level, whether you're a billionaire, or whether you're the janitor, we all want to be treated as individuals. And so when somebody hires our gifting agency to do all of their gifts for them, the one thing that we will never compromise on is we will always personalize it with that person's name. We not, might not be able to spend $7,000 or $20,000. It might only be $100 or $500 or whatever the thing is. But the key thing is to personalize it to that individual. The personalization makes all the difference in the world. And yet in business, we think we can get away with things we'd never do personally. Like we'd never show up at a, wed at a wedding and the Tiffany's vase, you know, compliments of giftology or compliments of John Rule, and that'd be the cheesiest thing in the world. But we do that in business and we think we're building relationships. Like God's wired us to want to be treated with, with our name and all about us. Like that's, how, that's in our DNA. That's the core of it. So personalization has to be central to relationship building. The second thing is, is the inner circle. If you noticed, after we did this crazy gift for Cameron, we followed up for a decade, every quarter, with things that weren't targeted to him, they were targeted at his family. Paul, my original mentor, got this in spades. It wasn't a tactic, it was just how he showed up for people. He would pour into people and treat the receptionist or the spouse at the same level he treated the CEO. And so there's four buckets. If you want to have your $100 investment have $10,000 of impact, you'll focus on this group of people. The spouse, the assistant or, or team, the kids, and the pets. When somebody hires our agency to do gifting, we direct 80% of their budget, not at the person who likes wine or golf or hunting or whatever else. We take care of their family. Because oftentimes, the family and the assistant get the worst side of business. And so if you can honor those people that are around the executive, or around the employee, and go all in on those people, your ripple effect, that person will go sell on your behalf. That person, that, that spouse, that wife, that husband, that assistant will go out of their way to advocate. And so Cameron couldn't get away from me. Even though he, you know, he'd get distracted, like his kids and his spouse or whatever else would talk about John Rulin all the time, even though they'd never met me. The third thing is timing. The third part of the recipe is timing. So often we do things and we think we're in the relationship building business. We say we're selling toilet paper, we're selling events, we're selling widgets. Everybody, like, no matter who you talk to, doesn't matter what they do, they're like, oh yeah, we're all about relationships. We're all about relationships, John. We're all about adding value. Like nobody says we're transactional. And I'm like, and so they'll come to me and say, John, we want to do a referral gift or we want to do this gift after a million dollar deal. And I'm like, are you in the, the transaction business or the relationship? They're all about relationships. I'm like, when you give a gift and it's tied to a deal or a gift after a referral, what did you just turn that relationship into? You turned it into a transactional relationship. Here's your million dollar referral. Here's your $500 Starbucks gift card. God's wired us to want to build relationships, deep relationships. We want to connect as human beings. And yet in business, we all follow the same playbook. We give gifts at Christmas out of obligation, out of expectation. We give gifts after somebody's worked with us for 20 years. And so the timing of the gift is just as important as what you're sending. Because the timing will show, hey, I was doing this because of the relationship, I was doing this as a just because versus you gave me money, here's your gift. You gave me a referral, here's your gift. You've worked with me for 20 years and put 40,000 hours into the company. Here, go pick out your gift out of this cheesy catalog. We don't realize what we're communicating to our relationships when we do these sorts of things. Most people in business in all areas, in all industries, think they're a 7 out of 10 when it comes to gratitude and generosity and appreciation. And really, they're a negative 3. 
Because most people are not gonna say, hey, I, your gift showed up at, you know, on December 15th and I already had 67 other boxes to open and I re-gifted that to the secretary. I re-gifted that to somebody else or I threw it away because I'm actually on a keto diet and you sent me chocolate. So you actually spent money, you invested money to have a negative thought and a negative impression with me. Your, your polo shirt or your jacket that you gave me that you were so proud of that was a Lululemon jacket but there was a logo the size of a softball on it, I actually re-gifted that to Goodwill. The timing, even a sucky gift that shows up in the middle of October as a just because can actually land decently well if you land the timing right. And so we call it planned randomness. We lay out for clients, hey, here's the four times a year we're gonna send out gifts to your employees. Here's the two times a year we're gonna send things out to your vendors, which by the way, like most people treat their vendors like garbage. And as believers, as Christians, we should be treating all people at a level that's way beyond what the norm is. And so for us, we take care of our suppliers and vendors with, with planned randomness gifts. Even though we're spending millions of dollars with them, we realize, and I, I learned this from a mentor who worked for OC Tanner, an $800 million company. And I found out that when Rolex comes to town, they take Rolex out even though they buy like $20 million worth of Rolexes. I'm like, why would you do that? And they're like, We're, we feel honored to carry Rolex and we would not have a business without vendors like Rolex. So we treat them like the customer. And they pick up the tab every time they come into town. And so the timing of the gift, laying out and saying, hey, we're gonna love on these people, not out, out of transaction, not out of expectation, not out of obligation, but as a just because. The timing makes it the difference in everything. The fourth part of the system is what's the most I can do? What's the most I can do? Early on in my business, I didn't have, you know, a ton of money and budget, whatever else. And so I realized that Paul, instead of saying, what's the least I can get away with, which is what most businesses do, he would just, like he would find, like he'd go to a, a pizza shop after a basketball game and find out that like there's a bunch of people that he loved there and some other people he didn't know. And he'd say, what's the most I can do? He'd just pick up the tab. And so it's so easy when you're in business to say, that's enough or hey, we can get away with that. Or, we can cut the budget there or whatever else. And relationships feel that. They can tell when you've gone all in. Your spouse can tell when you say, hey, it's the thought that counts. Like, that's BS. It's the thoughtful thought. It's when somebody doesn't have to go the extra mile, but they choose to. And when you start asking yourself, what's the most I can do in this relationship? What's the most I could afford? What's the most that I could do? Like my original mentor Paul did, relationships flourish because people realize that you're not doing it because you had to, you're doing it because you wanted to. You're showing up for people powerfully when everybody was pulling back. Like his way of saying that, the country bumpkin way was, you know what? An extra scoop of ice cream means the most on a bad day. Showing up for people powerfully and doing the most that you can do when everybody else is pulling back. When our back's in the corner, you're like show, showing people that you have their back. And it's not just with gifts, it's with time. It's like the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, who's another mentor of mine. There's multiple ways that we can show up for people and say, what's the most I can do? Can I handwrite the note versus shooting the text? Can I send them a video versus post it on their Facebook wall? Can I, instead of spending $200 on a gift, could I do 2,000 based upon this being a $2 million relationship? When you can say, what's the most I can do for this relationship? It would've been easy for me with Cameron to say, hey, you know, what's the least I can get away with? Let's do a couple Brooks Brothers shirts. Or, hey Cameron, here's a gift card, go buy your own clothes. Because I chose to go all in and not go up one or 2%, I went up 10,000% it melted his face off and it completely changed his perspective. And the last part of the giftology system is what would they really want? In business, it's so easy and personally, it's so easy to shop with our own eyes. If we like steak, we send people steaks. If we like golfing, we take people golfing. If we like wine, we send wine. If we send out a gift, it's in our company colors with our logo. A gift by its very nature, a gift the way God talks about it. You know, the, the, in Proverbs it says, a gift ushers you before kings. A gift by its very nature is focused on the recipient. It's focused all about them. It's not us shopping with our own glasses. It's saying, what would they really want? It's why for us, for our employees, we started realizing like a lot of our employees were working remote a long time ago and they, they didn't have time to clean their houses. So we started to say, hey, what's the most we can do? What would they really want? So we, we started cleaning people's houses. All of our employees now get all of their houses cleaned every other week. It's not optional, they can't take the cash. Their life is better, their spouse's life's better, their kids, they have more time. 
And so when you can start to put yourself in the other person's shoes, do they really want a crappy jacket or a logo or a, you know, a pe- box of peanut brittle? Or would they rather have something that they can take home to their family that's world-class, that's an artifact, that's, that's personalized to them? Do they, do they want a trip away from their family or a ball game? Or would they rather have more time home with, with their kids? Oftentimes, we, do the, we shop for ourselves. We do that with our families. We do that with our kids. We do that with our spouses. It's like the guy that shows up with a four-wheeler for his wife. She didn't want a four-wheeler. That was a gift for yourself. And so at a core level, here's how this all kind of boils out as we kind of land the plane. There's five parts of the giftology system. None of them are rocket science, but they're all important to show somebody else that they matter. There's a lot of noise and buzz and people say that they're all about relationships and they're all about culture and they're all about loving on people. And they'll say, oh, I feel gratitude. I feel grateful. They got their gratitude journal. And what they don't realize, yes, it's great to feel grateful. Yes, the Bible talks about gratitude. But at a core level, gratitude is not just a feeling. Gratitude is an action. Loving on our people, like as believers, at all levels, all industries, we should be doubling down and showing up for people generously and and doing gratitude, not just feeling gratitude. So I challenge you, start to write down, yes, I'm grateful for these people. Yes, I'm grateful for these employees and clients and partners, whatever else. But don't just leave it there. Don't just leave it at a feeling. Start doing gratitude and come back to me three years from now and say that my relationships, I challenge you to do that and to come back and say, no, that didn't work, John. Relationships are not flourishing. When we take the time to do gratitude, to do appreciation, to go the extra mile, to personalize, to do the giftology system, as human beings, we flourish.